Grace and peace to you and welcome to the Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 26th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All of them will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And Jesus said, Beware that you are not seduced. For many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the critical moment is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For it is necessary that these things take place first. But the fulfillment of all things will not follow right away. Then Jesus also said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places, famines and plagues. There will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors on account of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. Put it in your heart not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you a mouth and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be empowered to withstand or contradict. You will be handed over, even by parents, brothers and sisters, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But not a hair of your head will be destroyed. By your endurance, you will have obtained life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So we have the uh, pleasure of our seminarian, uh, we call Brother John, just to distinguish him from all the other Johns in the congregation, of which there are many. So uh, Brother John is going to be uh, preaching for us today. Thank you, Brother John. Absolutely. Well, you know, when I heard that it would be the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Luke that we would be preaching from for the Feast of All Saints, I was rather curious. And then I read it, and I thought it was even more weird because it had to do with the apocalypse. That all men and all women would hate us for the sake of the name of Jesus? That believers would be arrested, thrown into prison? So tell me, which among you wants to become a saint? (laughs) Any takers? You know, there was a song by Billy Joel where he had that line, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than weep with the saints. And yet I would rather stand with the band U2, I think Paul Coppola could probably agree with me on this one, who would say in pride in the name of love, you know, one man comes to a barbed wire fence, one man he resists, one man he came to justify, one to overthrow, pointing out that to be a saint often means speaking the truth, particularly the truth to power. Now, I could give a systematic lecture of theology that would make Brother Roy rather happy over here, along with Pastor Chris and some of you. But I would think I would rather teach as Jesus. And he taught us through parables, through storytelling. And I thought of one living parable from my childhood that touched my heart rather deeply. When I was a young boy, I would go around Thanksgiving time or Christmas time to my grandfather's place in Yonkers, New York. His name was John. I'm named after him. And he had a prayer study he would take me to. And in that prayer room, he had a wall filled with many images of figures of Christian history. But at the center of that wall was Jesus Christ, either an image of him risen or an image of him crucified, depending on the season of the year. And at the top of that wall, there were images of people from the Bible. You had Mary, of course, and Joseph. You had Pontius Pilate, which I thought was kind of interesting, but it was at least a way of entering the story of the Bible. And then he had images of people from Christian history, Francis of Assisi and Clare, images of figures such as Veronica from Christian tradition. And there was St. Lawrence who was up there holding his skin. 
I don't know if many of you know the story of St. Lawrence, but traditionally he was grilled to death by the Romans. And supposedly as they're grilling him, he says out loud, uh, guys, I'm quite well done. You can turn me over on the other side now. <laughs> the human hamburger. And you know what was quite interesting is after those litany of traditional saints, if you want to call them that, there are also images of the Reverend Billy Graham, the famous Baptist preacher Martin Luther King Jr., and even Mahatma Gandhi. And then there were black and white images of some of my grandfather John's friends we grew up with, most of whom at that point had been deceased, had gone home to their eternal reward. And this meant, of course, a rather deep source of reflection. People who we had gone to their marriages, their weddings, their funerals. And then at the bottom of that crucifix or image of Jesus were colored images, uh, rather recent images as a result, of people who were still alive, his children, uh, images of all 14 of us cousins, uh, images of other relatives who he still walked among. And as my grandfather would speak of these figures, he would speak about a living relative as closely as he would speak about Peter or Paul. Now, we Irish, we tend to embellish stories. <laughs> and I freely admit that uh, I felt like with every telling of the lives of certain biblical characters, uh, the events kind of took on new proportions. Uh, for example, uh, suddenly I found myself not only in the Garden of Gethsemane hearing about those events, but suddenly you had to have an Irishman thrown in for good measure. But what I find rather interesting about all of this is, according to Brother Martin Luther, as we stand here a week after Reformation Day, which among these groups could be considered a saint? I mean, okay, we have sola scriptura, right? The Bible alone. So you have Peter and Paul, you have Mary. But what about all those Old Testament characters in Scripture? Elijah, Adam, and Eve. According to Luther, are they saints? And then you have, of course, the figures of Christian history not contained in the Bible. People like Francis Sinclair, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, Martin Luther King Jr. What of them? And then, of course, these deceased relatives, those for whom we are to pray today, to commemorate. Surely, according to Luther, are these saints? And now, what of us, we who are alive and hopefully awake with enough coffee here today in this fine morning. You know, how do we account and measure up to this? And in Brother Martin Luther's mind, along with the entire tradition of the church stretching back to St. Thomas Aquinas, all the way back to Justin Martyr, and Paul and Peter and the authors of the New Testament, all of us here are called to be saints. And in addition, what is more remarkable is the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America is that even figures such as Mahatma Gandhi, through these figures, God, Jesus, can work anonymously, working great love and great witness and great healing in the world, to be open to God's loving presence, to be a vehicle for healing and reconciliation at a time when we are so divided as a nation and as a people, surely something of that magnitude should move us to reflect. When I went down to Philadelphia and I visited the campus of United Lutheran Seminary, I had a wonderful visit of the chapel there. And I was surprised and glad to find that around the main center of the church were 12 icons, 12 images of the apostles. And at the center of that church, just as at the center of this church, we have our baptismal font. And our teaching, according to the Augsburg Confession, our teaching as universal Christians, is that in baptism, through the yes of our godparents, through our yes at confirmation, through our yes as we come before the Holy Eucharist today, we then allow God in a deeper, more impactful way, through grace, through faith, to enter into our lives and to call us into sanctity. Now, there is a question that comes to the minds of many people in such a divided age. How do we define what it means to become a saint if then it is through that yes, with such ethnic, social, and political difference? 
Well, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the famous Lutheran pastor who resisted the Nazis, who spoke truth to power, who laid down his life for the sake of the good news, he had something of a surprising awakening. You know, when he was a young boy, I forget whether he was 12 or 13 years old, he told his parents, you know, I want to study theology. I want to be a pastor. Uh, at age 12 or 15, I have no idea what I wanted to be. Maybe a Jedi Knight? Yeah. <laughs> and yet, after a protracted illness, at age 18, this good little Lutheran boy wanted to go outside the country. And the first place he wanted to go to was to Rome, was to the Vatican, where he attended a Palm Sunday high mass, a high liturgical service. And he was shocked because back home in Germany, he celebrated and worshipped with people who ethnically looked like him, came from largely the same middle to upper social class. But in this Palm Sunday celebration, Bonhoeffer reflects that he saw exactly what John the Apostle saw in Revelation 4 and 5. Men and women, young and old, Asians, Africans, Europeans, all people from all walks of life, gathered together with palm branches in their hands, crying Hosanna in the highest. The radical inclusivity of the gospel of Jesus. And Bonhoeffer would take this when he would go to Union Theological Seminary here in New York and work closely with the Baptist African American community, which was already working towards civil rights in this country. And he would take those lessons of civil disobedience home to Germany to resist Nazism. Now, as we reflect upon that image, it is a reminder that to be a saint, we don't necessarily have to travel to the far ends of the world to shed our blood as a martyr like St. Lawrence. Hopefully we don't get grilled alive. And we don't necessarily have to get arrested or necessarily be thrown in prison. Although if you are called to act as social justice for the needs of others, this indeed is a high calling in Christ Jesus, and one which our church deeply stands on for all the marginalized and oppressed. But no, to be a saint of Jesus Christ, in that radical yes, as we are about to enjoy by partaking of the Eucharist, we are called as Jesus' body, as his hands and his feet, to enter back into our home, back into our work communities, back into community itself to heal the world around us. You know, back in 2020, during the pandemic, we all felt that isolation. And although there was great work through figures like Sam here and Pastor Chris and heroes such as Doug to live stream services, there was something that was somewhat missing. And that's why last week's potluck meant everything to us, along with all the excellent cooking. Shout out to all of you. And yet, when we realize that God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is community, when we realize that our Christian walk isn't something that ends here, but begins here, with the last words of our liturgical service being, go in peace. We are called to declare the good news, not merely within our churchianity walls, as Karl Bart would put it, but instead wherever we are placed. If you have a talent, if you have a gift, it has been placed in you and placed in me. So in the words of our baptismal liturgy, our light may shine before others, that they may glorify our Father who is in heaven. And might I conclude that with Brother Martin Luther, perhaps we should meditate on the radical yes of perhaps the least likely person imaginable. Two millennia ago, 2,000 years ago, who in the far edges of the Roman Empire, in a backwater called Nazareth, was a teenage girl in a patriarchal society where she was marginalized and was an unwed mother, compelled to flee as a political refugee, hunted and persecuted and called to watch her only son die. And yet she chose to say yes, so that God's grace, so that God's glory so God's light might shine through her. If God could call her and fishermen and tax collectors and the people who were forgotten by the world, 
Surely all of us, no matter our walk of life, no matter our ethnicity, no matter our background or disability, no matter what impedes us, by grace we are called here. So that we could say with Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I no longer live to myself, but to the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Brothers and sisters, this is what it means to be called as a saint of Jesus Christ.